Hello, my fabulous British literature students. Um, I've got Chewy with me here today. He's in his little snuggle sack, his little baby sling, which he loves. And he uh, reminds me of a little kangaroo <laughs> when he is in this thing. Uh, but he's very needy today, so he is going to join us via snuggle sack today. Uh, so my 1030 session did not record uh, or did not record did not even come up today. It just kept showing an error. So I am going to record a session, which is going to be so strange because I won't have all of you um, and your input and your <laughs> liveliness. So this will be a little strange, but um, I think I'll also make it available to my um, 940 students as well, um, just to kind of solidify that these character charts are filled out um, the way they should be. So have your character charts open, ready to go. We are going to talk about, um, okay, I don't know what you're doing there. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna like read about the character and then kind of show you how I would fill out the character chart if I were you, but I'm using slides instead of the character chart. All right, so, um, Let's just get started. So our original plan today was that we were going to finish filling in our character chart for the prologue, and then I was going to introduce the wife of Bath's tale for us all. At this point, you should have read the prologue. That was like a long time ago, early last week or mid last week or something like that. So if you have not read the prologue, you are currently behind. And we also had our late due date on Sunday. Um, you should have read The Wife of Bath's Tale by now. So don't fall behind in British literature. It's a difficult class to begin with. Um, it's really important that you that you stay um, current. We're going to be working on standard RL 12.1 um, today, cite relevant textual evidence that strongly supports analysis of what the text says explicitly, implicitly, and make logical references, including determining where the text is ambiguous. And all right, DOK, depth of knowledge levels one and two today, identify and describe is what we're working on um, in pertaining to the characters of the prologue, which are just being introduced to us by the narrator, Jeffrey Chaucer. All right, identify and describe wife of Bath. It says this is on page 34. In my 940 class, um, students went into breakout rooms and worked together to fill out this chart. Um, obviously we couldn't do that and I don't have my cheaters here, so I'm going to do my best to read this with my old lady eyes. Uh, starts on page 34, one line on that page, and then it goes to 35. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. So right away we know Bath is where she's from. So she's not the wife of a guy named Bath. She's from a city called Bath. Um, which a lot of people travel to uh, when they go to Europe. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us somewhat deaf, which was a pity. In making cloth, she so showed so great a bent, she bettered those of Ypres and Ghent. In all the parish, not a dame dared stir toward the altar steps in front of her. Ooh, um, be careful about marrying this woman. But right away, I see a physical description or mannerism, which is she's somewhat deaf, not completely deaf, but somewhat deaf. So I would want to um, add that to my character chart here. Somewhat, I'm going to put that even in quotes because I'm taking that directly from the text. Somewhat deaf. Whenever you can, it's kind of a good idea to um, use stuff directly from the text. Uh, let's see. So um, not a dame dared stir toward the altar steps in front of her. And if indeed they did, so wrath was she as to be quite put out of charity. So actually, I kind of read that wrong the first time. It's not a man should be careful of marrying her. It's saying women should not try to get in front of her um, when going to the altar. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground. I dared have sworn they weighed a good 10 pound kerchief, like handkerchief. The one she wore on Sunday on her head. 
Oh, let me see. I didn't read that right. Her kerchiefs were a finely woven ground, and dare I dared to have sworn they weighed a good ten pound, the one she wore on Sunday on her head. Her hose were of the finest scarlet red, and gartered tight, her shoes were soft and new. So she dresses in, could we say, some finery, um, which kind of makes sense, um, because I believe she is a textile person. I don't know. I could be, I got to come back to that. So let's say um, fine garments. Um, um, red stockings. Um, shoes were soft and new. I believe she's from the merchant's estate, so um, we'll get back to that. Bold was her face, handsome and red in hue, a worthy woman all her life. What's more, she'd have five she's she'd had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company and youth. No need just now to speak of that, forsooth. And she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. She'd been to Rome and also Boulogne. Uh, St. James of Compostela and Cologne, and she was skilled in wandering, by the way. She had gap teeth, there's another physical description, set widely, truth to say. Easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up, and on her head a hat as broad as a buckler or a shield. She had a flowing mantle that concealed large hips, her heels spurred sharply under that. And company she liked to laugh and chat. Ooh, that's a good thing about mannerisms, right? Um, gap toothed. Um, been married five times. Let's put that under background. At the church door, so they were all recognized by the church. Oh, well-traveled. She had been to Jerusalem, did it say three times? Yep. Lots of description for Wife of Bath. Oh, she liked to laugh and chat. So she must be easy to get along with, I would think. And knew the remedies for love's mischances. Ooh an art in which she knew the oldest dances. Hmm, she might be a good person to consult about affairs of the heart, i.e. love. A holy, m oops, now we're done. Okay, move down to the parson. So, um, I feel like I got a lot of things written down about her. We could always go back and, um, you know, visit her in more detail. But another thing is we're going to read The Wife of Bath. So we do have a lot of um, information coming up about her beyond the prologue. What I would like to do, though, is... See if I can find like a really good quote to put in quotes or evidence. I do have a lot of things um, in quotes in under the other two columns, but let's see. Um, I think I'm going to do that in all the parish, not a dame dared stir toward the altar steps.
Oh, dared, dared stir. For the altar steps, my um, email's going crazy, I'm sure, with students who couldn't get into class today. I just lost my place. Here we go. Cover the altar steps in front of her. Line, lines, uh, 459 and 460. I'm just going to add this to kind of for you guys. Um, I picture a funny scene of a woman trying to get to the altar in front of the wife of Bath. And and the wife of Bath pushes to get to the front. Just, I'm adding that for you guys, because I don't know, that's that's how what happens when I read. I see these pictures in my mind, and I'm picturing like her pushing everyone aside to get to the altar first. She's been married five times, and we don't really know why that is, but um, perhaps we'll learn more when we read The Wife of Bass Tale. All right, um, moving on. Whew, hopefully I don't spend 12 minutes on each of these. You can see why it was nice in class that we broke into um, breakout rooms to do these. <clears throat> All right, the Yeoman. So we are actually um, backing up to page 22 here. We read this in class the other day, but we're going to point out things now. So there was a Yeoman with him at his side with the squire. No other servant, so he chose to ride. This yeoman wore a coat and ho hood of green and peacock feathered arrows, bright and keen, and neatly sheathed, hung at his belt the while, for he could dress his gear in yeoman style. His arrows never drooped their feathers low, and in his hand he wore a mighty bow. His head was like a nut, his face was brown. He knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. A saucy brace was on his arm to ward it from the bowstring and a shield and sword. Hung at one side and the other slipped a jaunty dirk, spear, spear sharp and well equipped. A medal of St. Christopher he wore of shining silver on his breast and bore a hunting horn well slung and burnished clean that dangled from a baldric of bright green. He was a proper forester, I guess. <clears throat> All right, so um, there has been some talk about what estate he's from and I'm going to say he's a little bit... Um, higher up than just uh, like a peasant or a farmer. He owns his land too. So I'm going to say he is from the second estate. Um, he is <clears throat> aiding the knight and squire on the pilgrimage. Um, so he's quite, he looks like quite a, a sight, I would think. Um, a coat and hood of green. So I think it's like a green hooded coat. Um, he's dark complexion. Now that could be from being out in um, the sun, you know, all day working on his land. But other people have um, talked about if he could be from um, some foreign lands as well. I don't know that for sure, but um, it's a possibility. He has peacock feathered arrows. Wow, that's kind of unusual. Fancy. Um, he's got a shield. He's got a bow and arrow, a shield. A hunting horn. Doesn't he have like a knife too?
Maybe. I don't know. I don't know where I got that from. Um, he wears a medal of St. Christopher around his neck, as any proper Catholic would. Remember, everything revolved around the Catholic Church at this time. What else can we say about him? Um, he's a proper forester. Whatever a proper forester means to Mr. Chaucer, I'm not sure, but... Um, oh, did I miss any? Let's see, what can we put for a quote for him? There was a human with him at his side, no other servant. He chose to ride. No, the only thing that really like stands out to me is the one that I just used about he was a proper forester, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'll just use this first one. Um, there was a yeoman with him at his side. Looks like it's capitalized. Um, and him is the square, because the square comes right before that. So the way I do that is I use square brackets, because it doesn't come directly from the um, text. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And you know what, maybe some people want to do, feel free to put this one as well or in in place of. Um, I'm going to do, he knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. And something tells me that doesn't mean he like makes cabinets. It's like, I think he might mean this whole forestry thing. So I'm doing an ellipsis and then jumping to... He was a proper forester, I guess. Because I wonder if there's something to that. So let's see, that was line. He was a proper forester. All right, 110, 111, 112, and 121. What does this mean? Something to think about later. All right. Um, well, I think that's pretty good, given what we have for the yeoman. There's not a lot of description for him. All right. Um, because of the link that this is getting to be, I may need to um, either continue this or um, what we might do is just... Uh, do the breakout rooms in class tomorrow, but we'll do just one, two, three, four, five. Um, we'll do these other five, unless I happen to make yet another recording later on today and make that available for you. So 20 minutes is probably enough for you to um, watch of this right now, and I will continue this in one way or another later. Thank you for watching and enjoy your day.